Um, yeah, that's what um, that I, I think that's sort of what happens with with pre-sale. Like you're very lucky if you haven't exhausted your contacts by the time you get it out there. Yeah. So you got to do readings and get it out to, you know, new new crowds and somebody I saw somebody say online that they thought the uh, competition to do readings would be sort of intense this fall and this next school year because so everybody wants to catch up and get back out there, you know. Well, I can tell you I've gotten flooded with offers since I got my vaccination. Yeah, I have not gotten flooded with offers. I'm trying to look for places to to put some things together over the course of the school year next year. And I'm, I don't know, I don't necessarily have a ton of contacts. I've got, I got a buddy in Milwaukee. I've got some people in Chicago. I've got some people in Bloomington. I've got some people in Indianapolis. Yeah, no I, hmm. yeah I, I guess it helps. I have no other aspects to my life, so. Right, well, you've been all over the country too doing your thing, right, for a while, yeah. yeah. I'll, all over the country like i went to england for three weeks at the end of 2019 that's cool but um no I, you know i'd be hard pressed to find anything in indianapolis i i really have looked there for years and i i've never found much yeah but. well uh, yeah i knew i knew the guys who ran the uh the indie slam for a few years and uh, I, that was one, one of my favorite past shows it was that they scheduled me to read at the Indie Slam in April and it ended up being the, the very night that Butler was in a final four game in the NCAA finals. And so they, so they, they had a, they didn't have a slam. They just had me feature at halftime at this hipster bar where everybody, where they were putting the, the game on, a, you know, like projecting it on a screen. Yeah. And uh, I made a killing in the uh, when I passed the hat for that. <laughs> pretty cool. I didn't expect to either. I expected I, I, people to be like, "What the fuck is this?" But they people were into it. Hey, man, I I'll tell you what. I'm not surprised because I used to tell younger writers like I I started out reading poetry in bars, and the good yeah. thing about that is that, that people came expecting to spend money. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I think you go to a coffee shop and people like somehow seem to have uh, forgotten their wallets and yeah. like, you go to a bar. I, like, I did a lot of I did a lot of local bar open mic type things for a while. And that was always I, I mean, I was I didn't always get the best uh, reception from the local. Like I, I've read at the biker bar and they told me to get the hell off the stage and all this, you know, but, but overall it's, those have been good. Cause I, I learned to, I learned how to capture people's attention, you know, when it was successful. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I had a friend, uh, we read in this Irish biker bar years ago and he actually got a beer bottle thrown at his head. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, um, I had to spend, I, I had to spend half the night with him in the emergency room while he waited oh. to get stitched up. God. That's somebody who really doesn't like poetry. Holy cow. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, but if you ever, if you ever feel like coming down this way, um, they've been having me put together a monthly series here, like March through November. So. Oh, okay. When do, what night of the week do you normally do that on? Is it uh, usually, usually Saturday night. Oh, okay. Yeah, Saturday night might be good. It's in Missouri. This Elise, who's uh, on this, she's listed on the screen here, is my girlfriend, and she's right over here on my couch, too. Okay. <laughs> so she put headphones on so she could hear the, both sides of the conversation. Uh, well, I'm glad that she's there with you. Otherwise, I felt like we were torturing some person listening to us talk before you got started. <laughs> no. well, that's, she's a familiar, yeah. Um, but I don't know. I was hoping that I'd get a few of my. Um, I would suspect we'll get, showing up. I suspect we'll get some. I, I usually always get some people. Yeah. I'll tell you what. I've been getting a lot more attendance when uh, the readers have been women for whatever reason. It's uh, usually about 
three or four times what I'll get when it's it's a man, which I don't care as long as we have some people listening. Right. But, yeah, OAC, um, OAC Books is actually a, uh, a publishing imprint that was started at Osage Arts Community mm -hmm. by the executive director here. Um, okay. But in town, our bookstore, our primary bookstore is uh, Barb's Books. It's probably got, uh, it's probably got about 8,000 books in there. Um, it's really huge. It's a sprawling, sprawling store. But we also have a store in town called Bell Book and Candle. Um, mm -hmm. And for a town of 1,500 people to have two bookstores. Is, uh, yeah, that's rare. That's nice, definitely. Yeah, I've got books in some of the outlying communities here. I'm doing a book signing in Goshen, which is like 30 minutes north of me. And it's like the Warsaw's very conservative, and Goshen's very artsy. It's a, it's sort of bit they're sort of it's like sort of Superman and Bizarro Superman. You know, Goshen's the odd like Warsaw like place that's nothing like us. So are you are you originally from that area? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was born in South Bend, but I grew up in Warsaw here. Warsaw is uh, it's a really unusual community in northern indiana there's a lot of money here and there's also significant poverty here it's got the whole gamut because there's a the orthopedic company is kind of are the it's a company town for zimmer biomet basically they make hips and knees and stuff yeah i'm still i have to admit i'm still getting to know like even though i've lived in the midwest for years I, there are parts of it i'm still getting to know i grew up around pittsburgh mm -hmm. Yeah. You know uh, Dave Newman? I, I do know Dave and Lori both. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're good people. Well, I saw in your bio that you read at Pitt at Greensburg, where yeah. I know Lori's, Lori's at. I've read there, too. I actually yeah. I actually went to high school in Greensburg, so. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, we a couple a couple of years ago, I, I drove out there to do it. And then uh, a, a month or so ago, a month or two ago, I, um, I did a Zoom with Lori for Pitt Greensburg. It's cool. Yeah, I've wanted to talk to Lori about coming out that way again, but with her dealing with everything she had to deal with medically, I just was kind of leaving her alone a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I didn't I, know. I didn't know much about the about that situation until I saw she published some essays about it. I was like, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, they actually. Yeah, they live in uh, they live in Trafford, which is uh, around where my grandma lived. So. Yeah. And the traffic up there was terrible. I hate East Coast driving. I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather drive in Chicago. I can handle Chicago for some reason. Up there, it's like so. Maybe it's just because I don't know any anywhere I'm going. Yeah, I had a, I had a bad Chicago experience. So I'm used to driving in Chicago. It's not fun, but I can tolerate it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's sort of how I feel about Los Angeles. Everyone complains about it, but I've been going out there for years and i actually don't mind the la traffic yeah so i'll give uh i'm gonna give everybody about 10 minutes here and then yeah. and then we'll see who comes in let me see okay. Okay, I just got a nice message from Christopher Harder. Oh, cool. Hope I can get him to sign on. I'm trying to guilt some friends on Facebook into showing up. Yeah, I just I just posted a message on there too. A yeah. lot of times what will happen is people will hit me up and I won't 
look at the messages because I'm in the middle of recording this. So yeah, right. been reading your uh, new prophets of poetic discord book that you oh, sent yeah. with the other stuff i mostly uh the first poet uh ryberg oh jason yeah yeah i like that that's good stuff i just uh, brought that along on our yeah, on he's... go ahead oh there's joe cheney i'll let him know yeah he jason aggresses city i don't know if you know them i uh, know i missed that I, you cut out for a second there oh yeah no jason uh runs spartan press in kansas city i don't know if you know who they are not really no not too familiar yeah they're they've published uh he puts out about 60 titles a year now it's wow it's gotten to be pretty intense i really don't know how he does it it's like a one-man operation right yeah, that's a lot. I, th I think a lot like Tim Green. I think with Jason, it's kind of turned into his job as well. But yeah. even at that, like, I would go nuts. Yeah, I, I you know, I ran a magazine briefly for a, a few years with some buddies, and we got really turned off to editing a magazine after we'd been through about eight issues of that thing. I was ready to work on my own stuff, you know. So I have a lot of respect for editors because it takes patience and you have to deal. It just, it, it's the people sometimes presume things about what they're owed, you know? Um, now, when you were doing that, were you doing that with Don Winter? Yeah, that, it was Fight These Bastards with Don and my friend Orrin Wagner, who's a Warsaw guy too, or was a Warsaw guy. He's been kind of all over the place. Yeah, yeah I, still, uh, I still hear from Don. In fact, he wrote to me earlier today. Yeah, I, I hear something from Don every once in a while, or I see him post something on Facebook. Yeah. He's uh, he's into he teaches labor st labor history all the time now. That's his big thing, which you know, but judging by his poems, that makes a lot of sense. Oh no, it does. But, uh, yeah, no, I I actually remember the press that you guys ran. I. Um, yeah, yeah, just a handful of chaps and then about eight issues of Fight These Bastards. That's all we did. Yeah. No, I actually, a um, friend of mine has been putting together this like small press archive of materials. I've been donating stuff and I think I have some of that stuff. In those oh, two. yeah. Yeah, I don't even have a copy of every issue of Fight These Bastards. I've got, I've got several, but I don't have everything we, we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my the press that I've been doing with my friend Victor, we put out uh, we put out about a dozen books a year, and then we put out one issue of magazine at the end of the year. That's River Dog. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you uh, know, you, you know. Yeah, I, subs I subscribed after watching that Holly uh, Holly Day. Show yeah, I, you did. yeah, I heard that you had Victor keeps in charge. He's in charge of all of that. So. Yeah. But, no, it's it's fun. We're gonna start doing stuff on Mimeo next year, which will be a bit of a nightmare, but it'll be a good time. Yeah, like the old Mimeo machines from like the '60s type thing. You mean? Uh, yeah, Bill Bill Roberts from Bottle of Smoke. He just um, he has gifted me um, a Mimeo machine. Wow. Um, and it actually is the Mimeo machine that uh, Tom Chris um, owned, and he uh, printed uh, D. A. Levy's. Uh, you can have your fucking city back on. Oh, wow. So it, it, it has a lot of history to it. Yeah, that's cool. But, let me see if anyone's tried to hit me up here. All right. Well, I am, I'm going to get us started here, even though I'm going to wait for, or even though I, want to wait for people to trickle in we're just going to start talking
All right. Sounds good. All right. Um, I mean, Steve, let me, let me start off. You and I have known each other like sort of peripherally for a long time. We have a lot of mutual friends and I, I'll say that I think that I've gotten to know you better in the course of today. Cause I spent all day like cyber stalking you and finding <laughs> as yeah. much information as I could. Um, could you just, um, start off by talking to me a little bit about um, Guilty Prayer and how uh, the book came to be, uh, your relationship with Main Street Rag and what that process was like working on it with them. Oh, sure. Uh, this is just to show anybody who's watching, this is Guilty Prayer, Main Street Rag Publishing. Main Street Rag was about the, kind of must have been the 20 or 25th place I submitted it to. I was doing, I was sending it out to contests and to open reading periods at a few different places. And uh, Scott liked it. Um, he's been good to work with. It, those poems, uh, they come, a lot of the poems come from my first year. Uh, I, about four, a little over four years ago, I got sober. I quit drinking. And the poems come from that first year of sobriety. And of course, uh, as, the, as the book talks about, um, one of the central sort of motifs or experiences is the death by suicide of, of Lydia Hen, who we were divorced, but she's, you know, the mother of my kids and all that. And um, so I was, I was writing poems about that because I had, because, because I drank for several years to try to avoid thinking about it, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I was processing that. Um, there's stuff about, I, I attempted suicide in 1999. There's stuff about that in there. There's stuff about my psychiatric hospitalizations. It's a really, it's a heavy book in terms of a lot of the material, but there is a, there's a sense of humor in there and some of the stuff too. Um, uh, we met the cover image, by the way, that's a, that's a uh, portrait Lydia did of me. Um, she was in Parkview Behavioral at that time we were married still and she was having a lot of trouble. Um, just, she, she was borderline, you know, that was her, that was her diagnosis. And um, it's just it, borderline people have a hard time, just like they have a hard time with the routine and with the, just living, you know, like it, it, it's a lot of extremes. Uh, she's kind of up and down a lot. It's not really bipolar, but it's just, she's just sort of hot and cold a lot. And it was, it was difficult for her to, to negotiate with that and it wasn't her fault either it just she sort of she had all sorts of experiences growing up and otherwise that were that were traumatizing and uh um we've been divorced for about two years when she died and the, the whole the, the divorce was hard on the whole family and on on me and her and on the kids worst of all probably um but it's, it's some of that stuff it's that stuff that like, I really didn't necessarily even intend on dealing with, but I found as I got sober that I needed to write about some of this stuff because I needed to process it somehow. And it's not really behind me, but I just needed to put down some things about what those experiences were all about as a way of gaining at least some, some measure of peace of mind about what I've been through. You know? Yeah, I can't, uh, I can't imagine that that will ever be completely behind you but yeah i do understand trying to write write it out a little bit and, yeah um yeah i um yeah i i too am uh, someone who had attempted to commit suicide in the late 90s yeah um, 99 for me yeah yeah no i i feel like you know there like you said there's no there's no shame in any of it i mean it's best that you talk about it and right. i think I think it's great that you put it down on paper. One of the things that I wanted to ask you um, that I guess will relate to this as well is, um, you know, obviously we go through a lot of changes in the course of our lives. Like I've, I've read enough about you today to know that you've gone through quite a, quite a lot and you've talked about it, but how, you know, as a writer um, looking back, like how, how would you say that your your work has changed over the years? Um, well, definitely, I 
when I started, I, I did, I did all, all my good stuff, all my, most of my good stuff when I was a younger poet, let's say in the 2000s and I was putting things down was funny stuff. I was, I was, I came up in a, in a live, I'd read live a lot. And so I learned when I read live, if I was, I mean, I was sort of having, have a sense of humor that works in poetry to a degree, but when I read my funny stuff, that was the stuff that got the best uh, crowd engagement and reaction. So a lot of the stuff in my, particularly in my first book is, uh, is satire and that kind of stuff. Um, and then this, it just the, each book is a little different, which I like. Um, I think for me, it's good. It, for me, it, it's, I don't like when a, when a poet does the same book over and over and over again. And it doesn't necessarily be, have to be radically different, but maybe something about the subject matter, just about where they are in their life kind of develops over the course of their career, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I can speak to that as well. And that I used to write really funny material too. And one of the things that I've found is when you're not doing as much of that anymore, that's people still want that. Yes. And yeah. It, it can be a really hard thing to get past. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think in some ways back then it, 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 I took it, where I could take it for a while and it started drying up because I kind of done, I'd done all I could with satire, at least as far as what I was capable of. And, um, you know, I almost quit writing more than once. And when, uh, and the, I, I had stopped writing for a while for maybe a half a year or something. I wasn't doing much in around 2015 ish and Joe Cheney at IUSB uh, email me or Facebook message or something and ask for all the books that I had out. And I had the two from NYQ at that point and some chat books. And I sent him all that stuff. And he said, okay, well, if you come up with a manuscript, I can, I can see about if the uh, editorial board at Wolfson press, which was a new press, he was part of at IUSB. I can see if they'd be interested. He didn't promise me publication. He just said, if you put something together, then we'll, we'll take a look, you know? And that really, that jump started me back into writing. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't really doing, doing much of anything then. And that ended up being, that was after Lydia died. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of those books, a lot, a lot of those poems in a sad, the sad man book are about family life and about my kids. And I wanted to appreciate my kids in some way in there. And then we ended up actually sort of on a, via having conversations about what the book should look like. We ended up putting all those illustrations by my kids when they were younger at the time in the book. Hmm. And that's my favorite. I, I love that about that book. Uh, the cover image, you know, I even, I did the, when I, when I kind of toured for that book as a, did a re series of readings uh, around the Midwest and I, I printed up t-shirts and the cover image is something that my daughter, my oldest daughter drew when she was about 14 or so. Uh, so we put illustrations by the kids in there and uh and that was you know that was the first that was the book with the most extensive material about uh both teaching and family life so there was kind of a different focus there was a lot of funny stuff there's still a lot of funny stuff in that book but of course then you get into guilty prayer and it's like you know it's a lot of trauma the sense of humor isn't completely vanished but it's just very different in terms of subject matter um now, that's one of the things that I wanted to ask you when we, um, with, with Guilty Prayer, like when was, I, I guess, when was the material written and are you working on anything new right now? And if, and if you are, how is, how is that different? Oh, I'm, I'm backlogged on stuff that I've got put together that I'm looking for publishers for actually. Okay. Um, but Guilty Prayer, that was, uh, that was again, uh, uh, it was after, Guilty Prayer was after Sad Man came out. And really, uh, the, the Sad Man book was published right at the beginning of 2017. And on the 22nd of January, 2017, I got sober. I quit drinking. One of the reasons I quit drinking was because I thought uh, the Sad Man book was a good book and I didn't want to fuck up anything with doing readings drunk and that kind of thing. I used to do readings drinking all the time, you know. And I, it never, I, I never had a problem. With, it never was something that bothered me or something, but, it, you know, I just started realizing if I'm going to like try to try to put myself out there and sort of impress people and sort of make, make a, make a reputation for myself with this book, which is, 
uh, a university press, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a step up. Uh, then I have to like, I have to kind of take it seriously. I can't, even if I'm nervous, I can't drink and do readings. And I, I ended up, I obviously I had a larger drinking problem than that. It was enough to, to cause me to, to, to want to just stop. And, uh, and so that's, so that, uh, the sobriety came and then, uh, I was working with, uh, with Joe Cheney still, I was doing some and, and with uh, David Dodley, I took a workshop at IUSB with David Dodley. He was a really great, he's got like 15 books out. He's phenomenal. He's a collage artist. He's a really cool guy. And I took his workshop at IUSB and I, some, a lot of those guilty prayer poems came out of that workshop. Hmm. And uh, then, I, then I guess it was the year after that I needed to get more credits for some teaching purposes for the state of Indiana to allow me to keep teaching uh, college freshman composition, I had to get more English credits. So I took an in independent study with Joe Cheney at IUSB and we, we, I just worked on poems with him. We just, I just produced work and he critiqued and we just talked it over like every, every other week or so. And, uh, and that a lot of those poems came, came into a, uh, manuscript that I was going to read a couple of things out of today, but that one's called deep cuts. And uh, so I've got that as far as a, something that I'm trying to shop around. It's in multiple uh, queues and at various presses to, uh, as far as I've, I've submitted. It's probably out to six or seven places that haven't made a decision on it yet right now. And, uh, and then uh, I, after that, so that came out, I, I was, I've been trying to publish those poems that were in Deep Cuts. A lot of them have gotten out in magazines, but I'm still trying to get some of the stuff out there that's from those in the magazines. And, uh, and then later on, I, I took from, I put together a manuscript that I think was not near complete, but it was just a bunch of stuff that I had. And from that, I called a, uh, a smaller chapbook manuscript that I called a plum, uh, a plum being like, you know, grace under pressure and knowing the right thing to say at the right time. And all the poems and that book were about embarrassing, awkward moments where I said or did something stupid or just where the persona of the poems just did not, it's definitely had the, sort of the opposite of grace under pressure. <clears throat> so that's the, the newest stuff lately. And then of course I'm, I'm still writing it. It's, I'm not writing as much as I'd like to lately, but I also, I don't stress it because I know if I leave it alone, I eventually come back around to it. I don't, I don't worry about how much I'm producing very much anymore. I just let it come. Yeah. I, uh, I've, I've never been able to quite like, uh, stop driving myself crazy about about all that but yeah um, but yeah you should really um, you should really get a hold of Jason Reberg at Spartan Press I think he would uh, he, he might be amenable if you sent him some stuff in fact I could have him shoot you a message all right but um, all right well with that I'm gonna stop talking I'm gonna let you read a few poems all right, sounds good. Okay, I'm gonna start with a few things from Guilty Prayer. Um, I'm gonna read some stuff that you can't find in other places online just because I don't necessarily wanna repeat a lot of things that are out there. And there are a few things that are out there via Rattle and some other places. Anyway, this is a poem from Guilty Prayer. Uh, it's about, it's at least in part about being in the psych ward when I was younger in the 90s, it's called occupational therapy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another day, another disappointing casserole, sliding down the hill like a runaway Toyota. Some people are higher powered. I prefer to gas up on cream of mushroom soup. My mother never saw a bag of frozen tater tots she couldn't turn into a feast of loaves and fishes, so delicious. God bless her so much for I, am in, for I am an ingrate and a fool. There's something I should have listened to back then, something that would have prevented all the fucked up in this. I can't remember what it was, but I remember the consequences, the white walls, the smoking room, the creepy cryptic who ran a group called Occupational Therapy, the interminable hours awake but idle, the fear, the fear, the living death. OK, 
you know, on the opposite page of that in Guilty Prayer is this poem called Columbia Misery. And uh, I'm reading that because you're in Missouri and it seemed appropriate. Um, there's another one later that I'll read that's in Deep Cuts, but it was in Gasconade Review that I'll, I'll break out to a little later on. So anyway, this is Columbia Misery. What is it the addicted are really addicted to? Feeling better? If I felt okay continuously, I wouldn't know how to take it. After my wife's second tour of inpatient behavioral, before we divorced, the doc put her on lithium, stable as God's table on a flat, flat earth. Then she quit taking it, said she didn't feel like herself anymore. Who is it we're really married to when we drop successful medical treatment for alcohol or pot, illicitly acquired Xanax or Oxy? Our own misery. I lived there when young and stupid. Late in the semester, my girlfriend split with me because the only thing she liked about us was the almost sex we had so much. I got high and cried for three weeks nonstop, all the way back to Indiana. My brother brought me back on a 3 to 7 a.m. run to clean out my dorm room, looking the other way when I swept the stems and seeds from a desk drawer into the trash. It took 22 years of bad memories to bring me flush up to sobriety. We say we want deep love, don't we? Attitude or platitude? I've abandoned more lovers than I've loved. We can be so very close to climax when I bang shut the awful deadly chambers of my heart. Okay, I'll uh, keep going. Sure. All right, here's another. This one I don't, I haven't read this. I don't think it's online anywhere anyway. Uh, it's one of the sample poems on Main Street Rag's website and their page for Guilty Prayer, but I don't read this one out very often. Uh, and this is about, I want to preface this a little bit. It's a poem about the training we did. We uh, We didn't really know this was quite happening I think I don't remember very clearly but we did training for active shooter situations okay. at my high, at my high school and uh, there was a particular detail when they told us about how this training would would probably go or how it might be used for elementary schools and I thought of my own kid and I thought about how horrible and bizarre and awful it was to consider that we are training you're teaching kids to use this method to avoid getting mowed down by a machine gun, essentially, in a classroom. You know, it really horrified me. Anyway, the poem is called Role Playing Games. They trained us to barricade the classroom door with any things available. Stash an extension cord below your desk to tie to the handle, pulling tight out of sight on the other end. Imagine this, it's no seniors versus freshmen tug of war. In the training in the morning before conferencing with parents to prove a horrid point, they had us hide under desks behind file cabinets. The head of my department who can bake like Martha Stewart entered with a phony gun, pointing it around the room at people victim after victim, victim commanding, look at me in the face when I shoot you, bang. We looked at her and we were told now in this next drill, you'll feel empowered. They told us what they trained the kids in elementaries to do. So I thought of my own seven-year-old boy, a locally Twitter famous goofball, scrambling with his classmates crazily and randomly about a room in his newly built elementary school. Imagine training the kids, just imagine. Boys and girls, this is called fish frenzy. Now imagine commanding them. Fish frenzy, boys and girls. Fish frenzy now. This is what we've decided to do about disturb young men with guns bent on murdering our children. Imagine this. Imagine all of it. Admit that this is what we have become. Yeah, I... Um... I can only remember one time in my entire education up through high school, we had a, 
bit of bomb threat when I was, I guess, in about 10th grade. Yeah. That seemed so, I, I don't know. It was just so strange comparatively to now. I, I couldn't even imagine. Being we, we have had drills, not so much this past year during COVID, but in previous years, we have had what they call Alice drills where they uh, pretend like there's a shooter in the building. Oh, man. And the whole the whole school does that, and I think it's. I mean, you know, they're do, they're doing what they think is necessary to prep kid people or whatever. But I think it's just awful that we do that. I don't uh, think that's a solution to the to the problem. You know. Yeah, I mean, I'm Steve. You're you're in the public education system. Is that something that's common across the country? Do you know? Oh yeah, they have active shooter drills all over the country. Yeah, as far as far as I know, and this is a we do a particular system. I think they may be instituting some other system of of training. Uh, they're going to change. They, things always change in education. You know, you don't you don't get the same program but, working yeah. for for more than a couple three years at most. It seems like, and uh, and so I think locally they said they were going to yeah. do something else. But yeah, they have active shooter drills all over the country. They pretend like they bring someone in to play a shooter and they teach the kids where to run or how to hide or how to prepare to throw something at the shooter when they come in the room. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah to me that's just wild as uh, as as some as a single adult that hasn't been part of the uh, education system for such a long time. But uh, yeah. oh man. But yeah. I wanted to take a second off the subject and uh, say hello to a friend of mine who's here with us who signed on in between. Uh, Jason Neese, I see that you're here. I love you. Uh, glad to have you here to listen to Steve. Um, yeah, it's, uh, John Dorsey, glad to be here listening to some words. Thanks for having me. Hey, hey brother. Hope, it's, uh, hope, you're, hope you're doing great out there. But, um, you know, doing pretty good, hanging out with some friends in a hotel over in wine country in San Inez. And so you guys pop up. So I figured I'd come give it a listen. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you did. Is, uh, is Jamie there with you? No, I murdered him like three weeks ago. I'm with my new best friends. <laughs> there you go. But, um, all right. Um, Steve, I'm, I'm going to have you read one more poem. And then I'm going to ask you a few more questions. All right. Sounds good. This is, uh, this poem is really the heart, uh, at the heart of guilty prayer. Um, one of the hardest things I ever wrote and it's called dissociation. Some things cannot be talked about. The last time I saw my father lying on the living room floor, how I sat at my bedroom desk, Unable to concentrate on driver's ed homework, repeating in my head, I didn't need to run through the woods to the hospital on the other side of the neighborhood. Mom said this was nothing, so it would be nothing. Any moment now, back to our regularly scheduled life. Any minute now, back to our regularly scheduled program. Some moments I live again. So many moments when nothing happened. Confined in Bloomington, I was sure I would be beaten. I waited for it. I didn't do anything. It was like they expected me to acquiesce. We want to punish you and we want you to want your punishment. Crave it. Lick it up like spilt whiskey on the hardwood floor. Nothing happened. Nothing ever happens again and again. When he died, it was nothing. And she, she was nothing, another trick, another actor playing a role to provoke a response, another cipher in this matrix of sorcery, this joke of a life the gods gave me. But I do love the children she gave me, spare them, spare them, oh God, if it is true that you are good, because I want to believe it, to believe in you. Spare my children. I do love them so. Oh, man. Sorry, that one always gets me. 
Oh no, I understand. I have, I have a few like that. And, uh, I, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's better if you do so. Well, um, yeah, I, um, I wanted to ask Steve, obviously like, you know, if you've lived a certain amount of time, you have a certain amount of re regrets in this world, like whether they be as a human being, whether they be as a writer, if you just want to go, go that route. It, um, is there any sort of advice, I, I guess, as a writer, as a person that you would, um, looking back on everything, that you would give to yourself now, um, having been through everything that you've been through, and um, would you change? Would you change anything? Like not in terms of your life, but the work that you've produced, if you if you had the chance. Yeah, um, I don't know what like as far as ad advice for a younger writer. I would I would encourage you know twenty years ago, Steve, to get into a wider variety of poetry earlier in uh in his in, in my reading i eventually i read a lot of stuff and i've read a lot of stuff for a number of years but um the first several years that i was involved in poetry it was all small press indie stuff and it's which is good stuff there's it's all good but i i just i like reading stuff from a whole bunch of different uh perspectives a whole bunch of different you know schools uh academic people non-academic people in new york school uh, you know, young poets, poets who've been writing for 60 years. I just, I like, I like having a lot of, a lot of stuff rolling around in my head as far as what people are out there doing. And I think over the last maybe 10 years, we're doing a lot more reading a lot more widely, uh, has helped me a lot as a, has helped me in my own writing. Um, yeah. What are you, um, what are you reading right now that I might not know? Because I, like you, I like to read everything. Is there anything that's really hitting you? Uh, I'm reading a, an older Mattia Harvey book called Modern Life. That's the poetry I'm into now. I also, I read it. I read uh, essays sometimes and, and some fiction too. And I'm also into Toni Morrison right now. That's something that uh, my girlfriend's really into Toni Morrison. And I, I, I set aside Paradise to read sometimes. So I'm reading Paradise now. Hmm. I read her book of... Uh, what's it called? I forget what it's called, but the book of essays and like uh, speeches that she gave that came out right toward the end of her life. That kind of got me. I read that, too. that was really good. Toni Morrison in general is like such a, I don't know, like interesting influence. I love what you were saying though, like diversification on, you know, whether academic, non-academic, I'm kind of like, don't care about those phrases anymore. It's like good or bad or writers. that make sense to me, but like, I'm right. totally what you were saying there. Yeah, I don't. I, I agree. The, the the distinction between like academic versus you know small press or indie that's pretty. There's so much. There's such a variety of stuff out there, and there's so many young poets doing all sorts of stuff. It's like the the field and the the field and in, in, in web publishing is so vast that there's just it seems like there's a lot of stuff to. It, it just almost feels like this whole conversation. I feel like has been going on forever and. But Dorsey and I have been in the same kind of generation. I'm getting to know you a little bit more tonight, just listening. But it's like this, it's, it's a distraction, really. I mean, I mean, I, I was, I have a BFA in writing from a, a university, but I also ran a, a, a indie publishing house that everybody I published didn't give a fuck about a degree. It's like, at some point, it's like, who cares? Like, if you can somehow get your words out in the format of poetry, which is like so bizarrely abstract and unique and whatever that x factor is it's like man i just feel like we're really getting lost in the distractions of this <laughs> academic versus non-academic stuff but that's my random unasked for two cents sorry <laughs> now jay it's uh yeah it's good it's good to hear you man you know that i agree with you i'll, I'll read anything i can get my hands on um right now i'm actually uh slowly teaching myself spanish uh, so that I can read, I, I'm friends with the girl who's Ted Berrigan's, uh, is translating all of Ted Berrigan's work in Spain. Whoa, that's crazy. 
And uh, she sent me all of these Spanish texts, and now I have to teach myself Spanish so I actually can read them. Uh, That's cool. So I, love your, I love you're doing that, though, Dorsey. That's fucking rad, man. Hey, man, what what else am I going to do, right, man? It's a, it's a good use of my time. So, but, um, Steve, I, I wanted to ask you a question that I used to ask basically everybody when I was doing newspaper interviews all the time, like uh, whether whether or not I was talking about like an art exhibit or a film or whatever, like obviously, like in the grand scheme of things, we can buy any number of books that we want. We're fortunate in that way. Um, why, if someone had the opportunity, um, why would they, why would you say they should pick up a copy of your book? Oh, well, I think that there's a different reason for each book, probably. You know, there's, there's, I count Guilty Prayer as number four, even though it's, it's chat book sized, uh, you know, like technically speaking, I suppose, but it's really, it's my best one. And um, uh, I think to, to look at all four of the, the main books that I put out, I think it's, it can be interesting to look at the development of the persona of the, but really, it's really me, you know, people use this term of persona or like, or that kind of idea that you're not really the person in your poem, but I really am pretty much the person in my, in my poems. And I think it's, I like that there's a development of this person from book to book and it's not static and there, it, and the person changes and uh, eventually we get into sort of deeper, uh, by guilty prayer, we get into, um, experiences that have some depth to them and that are that were really hard to write about and i think people have everybody has those experiences that they they avoid thinking about even and uh for me that it was powerful to to uh write about those kinds of things and it was powerful to write sober in 2017 for the first year that i was sober when i'd been doing when everything that I did in poetry was at least loosely connected to drinking beer, you know, like I did readings while drinking and I, and, I, and you know, I, I was in a band, I was in uh, uh, like a folk punk rock band and we put out an album and we called it Sunday beer because they had blue laws in Indiana. Very much part of all, that was very much part of my whole life. Uh, and so it just, the, 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 the voice of the, the voice of the poems and the, the person behind the poems changes book to book. And I think the change happens in interesting ways and it, it, t it tends toward it. We tend to get more depth in the later couple of books than we do in the earlier couple of books is the way I read that. But. I, you know, just to touch upon something you said, which is, uh, that, uh, the, the idea of the persona, which, um, you know, we, you and I talked about like how you used to write humorous poems and I used to write them too. Mm -hmm. and, and that's part of who like we are as people. But I think like as you get older, the poems are like more deeply about you. And um, I, I don't know, this is kind of a difficult question. And for me, it's day to day. But when you look at the poems now, in like a narrative sense and the persona being you um when, when you get to the when you get to the end of all that do you do you like the person that you see in the poems uh yeah i i think i do even the there's some misguided stuff <laughs> a little bit in some earlier work that i don't really want to try to defend there's some stuff in that first book that i don't much care for anymore i do i like the the, the Steve Penn of the last couple of books. And uh, I think it's also pretty natural to move from being less serious, being more more into satire and more into making light of things early and then to move into like, you know, you live long enough and you end up living through some tragic experiences and or you end up looking back at experiences that you've been through and going, man, that was really kind of fucked up. Um, and so there's a tendency, I think, as you get older to get a little more serious about what you've been through, at least. That's the way my work works, you know. Yeah, I, I, it definitely has been been the case for me. I think uh, 
I don't know. I, like we all are, I, you know, I'm, I'm still evolving. I like, I hope, yeah. you know, if you stop growing as a person, as a writer, as an artist of any sort, like I, I don't really see the point in all of it. So I think I, for me, the growth uh, personally, as far as doing my own work and also oftentimes in reading other writers, the growth is the interesting part. How a writer changes from book to book is is that's really interesting to me when I see that in writers that I return to, you know. Yeah, I I, I can imagine. I I feel the same way, and I can imagine like finding things when you go back to look at your own work, finding things about yourself that you learned that, you know, that were so. I don't know. You didn't even see them coming, and then there they were. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, it's it's a, the writing process can be a process of discovery too, right? You learn things just by thinking about them and putting things down on paper that you, things that w would would not have occurred to you if you had not been writing about it. You know? Yeah, that's most certainly true. Um, yeah. Well, um, I'm gonna uh, if you want to read a few more poems. Sure, no problem. Uh, this is a new one. Um, and it's about uh, this, this is, this is all basically true story stuff in a way, most of it. It's about this kid who was the poor kid at my, the, the elementary school I went to was Sacred Heart Catholic Elementary, locally here in Warsaw. And there was a, there was a kid who was definitely from the poor family and that, that we even, you know, have they, you have that sometimes in, in school cultures, you have the kids who are popular and the kids who are not. And anyway, this is called The Poor Kid. It's about some of my experience in elementary school. We were going to have a rumble during recess. The idea of fighting made me nervous. At the moment it went down, secretly broadcast for a bizarre nationwide audience of interested voyeurs and kindly psychopaths. But you couldn't have told me then. I wouldn't have known that then. I pushed the weakest boy in fifth grade, the so skinny he looks sickly kid, John Mahovich, oldest of a giant clan of poor kids. Yes, that's his real name. I always use real names in my poems. And in this way, noticeably anxiety ridden and singling out the weak for especially attentive oppression, I remind myself of most of our politicians, the whole damn caviar choking chamber of senators enriching themselves to cry in the work ethic of the poor when an extra $300 in unemployment is enough to keep sensible citizens home in this everlasting decade of trauma and futility and humankind as train wreck in slow motion. For years and years after that school year, I only heard the name John Mahovich once on regional network television news. A stepfather, his ex's new man, had beaten John's child so severely the child died. And I wanted to call him right then and there and apologize, not for his ever resting child, that wasn't my fault, but for being cruel and stupid and for treating him like he would never belong which every one of us were eager to do in that Catholic school they taught us, blessed are the poor, but close up they tended to smell bad. One year on the last day of school, I think it was the year the Martinez boy kicked the over-friendly fat kid in the head. My so-called best friend, who was more of a personal bully, a bully providing concierge level service, sat outside on a plastic school chair because we were tasked with washing the furniture, any damn thing to keep us busy when the worksheets have run out. And John Mahovich snuck up behind the boy and yanked the chair out from under him so he fell on his ass, like a magician yanking a tablecloth out from under a table setting. Except my bully boy went down, boom, on his ass, but the reason he sat there not contributing to the labor force was because he jumped off the swings at the apex of his flight during recess a couple hours earlier and landed right on an arm, which was probably broken. And he cried out when John pulled the chair and cackled with that weird, bizarre laugh that we also assume must have something to do with him being poor. And one of the Sister Mary Holy Water, Holy Rosary incantators, one of the good girls, I mean, went, John! And we publicly abhorred him collectively and personally, tut-tutting and how could you eat and generally preening and showing off the most moral of our peacock spread of feathers because John wasn't being meek and we weren't about to let him get away with inheriting the earth. Okay. 
And then there's a poem that's sort of, there's actually a poem that's referred to in that previous poem. And this is something that you guys put out in Gascon, Gasconade Review oh, a couple of years ago or so. And it's in my uh, unpublished full length manuscript called Deep Cuts that I've got, that I'm shopping around out there. And it's called Fresh Fried Chicken for Lunch. Oh, yeah. Also a uh, elementary school poem. In fifth grade, one boy's mother brought him KFC at lunchtime, brought it straight into the classroom. He'd wheedle and whine, thank you, mommy, I love you. He looked like Chunk from Goonies, so we called him Sloth. <laughs> he tried hard to be friendly, so we hated him. Joking about Weight Watchers, about donut dinners, followed with mashed potatoes for dessert. I learned from my own mother a lack of self-control was something shameful. It was like to make us look at that behavior was so rude. Eventually, a boy who played arm, army earnestly kicked him in the head on the playground after lunchtime while he cowered and whimpered and whimpered and begged. I remember the shameful feeling then. Some of us felt we'd gone too far. Some of us felt he'd earned it. I, uh, I still love the poem, it's so good. Yeah, I think sometimes when you write and sometimes when you write stuff that uh, acknowledges when you were not at your moral best, right? Those, those, that kind of honesty can be useful for poetry because we all have, you know, those experiences where we didn't do the right thing or where we could have gone this way and could have done the, could have done the thing that, that was, was heroic and we didn't and that kind of thing. It's actually something that appears in my poems quite a lot. Yeah. At least lately. Yeah, no, I, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it's true. I think the majority of the poetry that I enjoy these days are usually poems about when people aren't really at their best in one form or another. Um, yeah, they, the, um, I'll just say one thing about uh, Gascony Review is actually about to release issue number seven. Nice that actually was created after I was appointed a city poet laureate here by the mayor's office. Uh -huh. um, and then we got grant funding from uh, Kingsford uh, charcoal of all things. <laughs> awesome. Uh, because they're the number one employer in the town where I live, but they yeah. will, they will provide funding for literary materials. If you can prove that they're going to be used in the classroom. Oh, okay. So, Nice. So you I got, I, so you got I, those into the classroom too, then, huh? Oh, we did, and so I can tell you, your poem was uh, read it at, uh, at Bell High School. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, and we have some we have some wonderful wonderful students there. I've had I've lectured in that classroom a few times. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will uh, we'll, we'll get back to it, but I'm going to do my spiel here one time because I always forget to let people know that uh, you're listening to OAC Books Presents. Um, this is a podcast sponsored in part by Osage Arts Community, which is an artist residency in Bell, Missouri, offering space to artists of all disciplines for uh, one week to one year, typically. Um, and they accept applications year round if anyone is interested in finding out more. Um, you can message me on Facebook and I will tell you all about it. Um, you are listening to Steve Henn, who has uh, been gracious enough to share his poems with us here today. And I'm really having a good time. So hopefully um, we get some viewership after the fact on YouTube. We always seem to. Um, I will, uh, I guess what I'll ask you now, Steve, is... Um, is there anything that we haven't talked about in regards to your work, um, the availability of your work? If you're, I know oh, yeah. trying well, to get it out there. Anything you'd like people to know? Um, they can. Anybody can go to therealstevehen.com. That's that's two ends on hen, but at therealstevehen.com, if you go to the book tab, then you have links to buy uh, "Guilty Prayer" at Main Street Rag, and you have a link to buy "Indiana Noble Sad Man of the Year" on Amazon, which is where it's available. And you, you also have links to NYQ, which the first two books were out via NYQ Books. And so, 
uh, if you're interested in purchasing books, that's where to go. But also, there's um, there are more recent poems that have been published online or are up there. There's a there's a whole page of continuous page of whatever whatever I get published on the internet. I always link to on there, and there's there's other things. So that's sort of the the catch-all place to find stuff. Um, and then I'm Indiana Sad Man on Instagram, and I'm Mr. Steve English Hen with a ENG in the middle, not the whole word English, uh, on, uh, on Twitter. On Twitter, I decided to, to basically integrate poetry and teaching. I don't, I don't, I don't keep any of that separate. I, I, I operate on Twitter as both a poet and a teacher simultaneously. Uh, hmm. So that was a decision. I, 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 I've written enough poems about teaching by now or had enough experience working with high school poets and so on that I feel like that's an integral part of what I do also. So anyway, that's a, that's a few places to find some stuff. So do you, on that subject, do you have, um, I know you have your, obviously your own students that you teach, but do you have people approach you on Twitter in terms of questions about poetry? On Twitter, uh, I just I participate in conversations here and there, but I, I I'm not super. I mean, I, I talk more with local people on on Twitter. I guess I more often get reactions from my from my students on there or from their parents or something like that. Well, I think so it's we, uh, I think it's pretty cool that you interact with your students and their parents on there. Yeah, uh, I know yeah. a lot. Of teachers in this day and age probably wouldn't do that, but it's uh, just another way to reach them, so. Yeah, and you kind of have to be cognizant that anything you put on there is public, and so you can't get a little, you can't, I mean, I, I get pretty frank, but you also have to be willing to, you know, you can't be reckless with what you have to say on Twitter because anybody can see that. So. Yeah, that's true, but um, yeah, I've yet to figure out the, uh, really truly figure out the Twitter algorithm I don't, I'm not, whenever I engage with poets on there, like there's a few poets who I talk to here and there, but most of them just kind of ignore me, <laughs> to be honest. I'm not really integrated in the Twitter poetry community very deeply. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't really communicate with many people in there myself. There are a few poets that I met in Europe while I was there relatively recently um, that talked to me. Like I have a group of Irish poets that'll talk to me, but no. Mm -hmm. No one really in the U.S., but yeah. Um, but um, all right. Well, I am going to stop talking, and I'm going to let you um, read uh, the remainder of the poems that you would like to read. Okay. Well, I've got uh, it's four too many. I've got four on my list, but it doesn't have to be four. Oh no, that's that's perfectly fine. Okay. All right. Then we'll start. This is one. This is another kind of awkward situation. This is a true story. It's called You Make the Call. It's about basketball camp. At Grace Basketball Camp, if you made 100 free throws in a row practicing by yourself, you could get anything you want from the snack bar on the last night of camp when the parents came to watch the All-Stars and see who got named Mr. Hustle for the week. Well, I didn't make 100 free throws in a row but I pretended I made a hundred free throws in a row and put my name on the board that said so, thinking no one would know. I was real close anyway. I must've got to 89 before one rimmed out and I said close enough. And at the Friday night awards, when they called the free throw kids, I booked it to the snack bar up in the second level of the bleachers and scored a giant Coke in a giant container, the dimensions of which were approximately the dimensions of the human head. And I turned to descend two steps my hands slipping, the drink crashed on the dirty floor. It was an evangelical basketball camp, which means they had Bible study every night, which was optional, but you couldn't spend that time on anything else if you didn't go. They were really on a mission to send us each a message from God about the error of our ways and so on. And there I am at the snack bar stairs, looking at this giant puddle I'd created, feeling the shame that was less than divine, and I rushed off clutching that shame to my chest because I deserved it, leaving the mess for a hapless camp counselor to clean up. And I know what you think I'm going to say. You think I'm going to say, and that was where I learned to lie and let someone else bear the consequences. But the karma of that moment, dear reader, was returned to me thereafter tenfold shame, shame, bounties of shame. And haven't I always borne the consequences of the lies people have told about me? Hmm. 
little unexpected turn in that one. Uh, this is one from the Aplomb manuscript. This, the title of this poem may be the renamed title of the chapbook if I feel like it, I'm not sure yet. A lot of the poems in that, in that book also have to do with masculinity. This is called American Male. I know why I don't golf. I have a temper, you see, and even though my younger brother bested me at most things involving athletic grace or perhaps because of it, long did I incubate a singular competitiveness encouraged by coaches, teachers, my mother, but mostly male figures, mentors slash authorities, adults who determined that unleashing a hyper-competitive nine-year-old contestant nearly, contestant nearly foaming at the mouth with crazed lust to possess whatever ball happened to be in play and put it right where it belonged would prepare him admirably for 21st century American capitalism or prison or the Senate, really just about any American institution. So I can't golf because I can't handle intending the ball to fly straight while watching it slice through the trees to the right or plunk in the drink because if it does, I'm throwing the clubs, the bag, and the caddy in after it. I don't golf because it's like learning ballet. Any 44-year-old novice would clumsy through it so awkward, breaking ankles and spraining wrists, stepping on someone else's feet with those probably unnecessary, don't you think, spiked shoes. For reasons much the same, I don't fish. For a few years I did, but it always felt like my body was learning a language my brain was too ossified to interpret, clutching the pole toward the water, casting the hook behind me to catch in my hair. Come to think of it, I do not like to do anything I'm bad at, which might be why I'm good at so few things. That flash temper immediately responsive to quick, humiliating, frequent failure. Two weeks ago when I was taking too much Welbutrin on accident, consequently feeling super stressed, contemplating secret suicide, I had a minor anxiety attack at Menards because I failed to accomplish buying a mower. What nascent genius saddled the American male with yard work? Why do I always feel a surge of anxiety stepping into a hardware store? Isn't it true I'd rather sit out back in a cheap lawn chair reading poems than do the edge trimming or admire a full wall display of oppressively shiny tools? The president plays golf too. Any president, take your pick. And there I rest my case because no ambitious nine-year-old with his faculties intact, capitalist or otherwise, wants to grow up imitating that buffoon. Okay, a couple more. This one is my first, I, I mentioned to you, I think maybe even before we were recording much, that I've been driving a taxi cab as a part-time job during the summer. I'm not teaching. And so this is the first poem I wrote about being a cabbie. It's called Part-Time Cabbie, the part that feels like work. Hmm. The worst part of driving cab part-time, the only part during which I sweat, is in washing the cab at the end of a shift. I haven't seen anyone else do this regularly except for the company owner and myself. So I don't know if it's really protocol or if I'm building myself the reputation of a brown nosy new guy. First, the big brush slopping on the suds, then the rinse holding the nozzle of the hose aloft and depressing the handle lightly to get a mist and not a torrent. Then the towel hand drying all over, then the purple spray on the interior floors, scrub, scrub, scrub the stains and rake the little pebbly shit out. Hose off floor mats on the wash bay floor, wipe them down and put them back. It's a 20 minute job without slacking when my back hurts from seven hours slouching in the driver's seat and I break out in sweat pools. So I've taken to taking my collared shirt off to finish cleaning in a tee. And I settle up the paperwork leaving the driver's sheet and whatever cash on hand that belongs to the boss and not me, slipping them with the gas receipt down a slot in the top of the office wall safe. Then I drive my own minivan downtown to the bar I used to drink at frequently and suck down two big Cokes, zip, zip, and leave four folded $1 bills tucked under the plastic cup. If the Coke is free, as it sometimes is in honor of those who choose to drive away sober, that's a good tip for the bar keeps. Get back in my dad ride, head over to the high school to pick up my boy from band camp. And I've got one more. This is a new one. And I'm not, uh, it's probably not in its final form, but I wanted to try it out anyway. It's called Parabolas. 
it was started out being about family history, but I don't know what, what it ends with. It doesn't make any sense. Um, parabolas. <clears throat> we are not farmers. No offense to farmers. Farmers quite literally feed the populace. It's just not something we are. My mother grew tulips. I had the idea of her as a goodness because her thumb was green enough to help things grow. We're mostly accountants, I guess, living in the abstract, living in a world of math. It bothers me to travel very far down the line of thinking where everything ends up made of math. Our organic interface with reality is limited enough. I don't like thinking there's a maze of equations underlying it all like we're playing some sort of complicated multidimensional Tetris. It appears to be difficult sometimes for me to differentiate between what seems in the world and what I know in my head. I suppose that makes this labored living into a kind of calculus, which I bombed as a youth, but the poor and kindly teacher gave me a C. I heard once, God prefers checkers to chess. It would be a comfort to know. That's all I got for you, man. Oh, that's great, man. I, I like that last poem a lot. Thank you. You know, it's, uh, well, I, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, and uh, hopefully we, uh, we do get some traffic after the fact. I will promote this heavily because I am taking off next month uh, because I'm promoting a reading here locally where I have about 15 readers. Oh, good deal. Yeah. Is that Tony Brewer reading in that? He oh, is. Yeah, I know him from Bloomington. He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. It, people are chomping at the bit to get out again. And I was yeah. a little hesitant because I didn't think I'd get anyone who wanted to come out. And then I got sort of flooded by people that were like, please, please yeah, let me awesome. come do it. So. Um, so I'll be doing that next month and we'll come back in August and I'll figure out who the guest is going to be that month. Um, I actually, have, if you know, Mike James, I have him coming here okay. live, um, September 11th. He'll, he'll be. Oh, here. oh wow. Okay. So. Nice. Well, thanks for having me on. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, it's not a problem, man. I'm glad that we did this. I'm glad that we got to talk more. Um, you know, I feel like you're always there. I'm always there, but please like, uh, drop me a line anytime. So All right. it's been good to do this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pick up a copy of your book sometime in the next few days. I always do that whenever anyone comes on. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, uh, just going to close and just say that you have been, uh, you've been listening to Steve Hen on uh, OAC Books Presents. And uh, like I said, we will be back for the month of August. Thank you, Steve, so much. Um, really appreciate it. Um, all right, everybody, um, have a good night and I will see you later. Thanks so Thanks much. Time. See ya. See ya.